Hello, everybody. Everything's online. Just moving some windows around. Letting everything spin up. Happy Sunday, everybody. Here we are in our, um, I guess it's Easter, isn't it? Ah, I don't know these things. I went to the grocery store earlier. I'm like, why is no one here? Then I realized, oh yes, tis the Easter. But that is okay. I'm actually just pulling up some very old sketches I did on a stream a long time ago. These are the same thing, aren't they? They kind of look back at those at this point. Well, welcome everybody. Um, do, do, I'm just gonna type welcome. I'm just gonna type welcome, just in case. Just to double down on the welcoming because really the world can never be welcoming enough. <laughs> yes, that's that's how I always feel, of course. Uh, so we're gonna paint up this, uh, this one here, this more developed image today. And uh, I thought it'd be fun to kind of look back on the initial sketches that have, uh, turned into this some very long time later. Uh, and I have these original sketches and I think we did these on a stream, and this is just a small sampling of a bunch of different um, simple shapes I sketched. Uh, and then we drew a few of those out in more detail in Photoshop. And there's this one, which is pretty close to where we wound up with this right here. At least that was the basis of it, I'll say. You know, it, it shifted a bit as our focus shifted. Um, and then there were some other ones that I thought were interesting too. And in fact, I think um, I, think I even modeled this one in uh, the new Adobe modeler, but never finished, like exported it and got it in anywhere. And this one I was sort of planning on coming back to. In fact, as I was developing this, I thought it might be interesting to have a separate scene that maybe the architecture is more intact, like picture almost like a domed cathedral sort of shape. And this um, more anthropomorphic looking one here is kind of in the center of that. And the uh, back like tree the tree kind of coming out of his back or well it's his whole body but this one big vertical shape is uh twisting and coming up through the a hole in the roof in the cathedral and that would let us do a little more architecture um and maybe cathedral is the wrong thing but that's just i was like oh that could fit in with this but i don't know maybe maybe too similar but that's what i was sort of thinking when i went back to these old sketches uh, and i brought them up just to sort of see if there was any just sort of anything in them i wanted to still capture that maybe i missed and i one thing I liked about this one is I like these kind of weird little wispy um, uh, foliage that it has, like these little weird leaves, like in kind of here, there's like some of this, uh, and some of the blue in there. And I, you know, this, this image went for a little more of a golden desaturated uh, feel than this initial color workup. But um, I do want to bring a little more color into it, like sneak some color into the shadows. And I still need to paint these, um, these sort of priest characters up here. Uh, which are still the sort of like basically just a gray model these little characters here So I'll probably pull in some colors with them there um, And that's what we're gonna do today I think is just paint this up in Photoshop and see where it goes uh, And as you I'll probably maybe I'll just leave let's see Let's just leave a couple of these open and tiny just tiny off to the side maybe um, Just to look at them. I'm just gonna put them over here Just in case I want to riff on it in some way uh, and then this image let me make this a little bit bigger so everyone can see this so this image um was rendered we you know we over several sessions we modeled this in um i think it started in um adobe medium vr sculpting tool and then it went to zbrush and then i decided to shift the focus a bit and added a whole lot more faces onto it and then there were people asking about using unreal so i took this into unreal and then we um uh use some of my existing priest models I'd made previously, some of these characters here, as kind of stand-ins, but I never, you know, we're just gonna develop them here in the painting. We didn't develop them in model. And actually some of this architecture here, like most of the architecture, in fact, actually all the architecture are pieces that I had from a previous painting uh, that I did a little bit of quick work on and put in this. Hey Deidre, how's it going? Happy Sunday. Uh, and then the foliage, the trees, the big trees, the sort of more standard trees are mega scans. Um, and then the whole thing was put together in Unreal 5 and rendered out. 
uh, which we did last time. And I remember <laughs> ending last time going, why, where's the button for this? Why won't this render up? And it was just a, um, a stupid thing where I had specified the default single image range, which was like zero to zero and, or zero to one. And then it, it thought that was null for some reason. So I had to like, or maybe I had it zero to zero, which in some rendering apps, that means one frame or one to one. I had to actually add a frame. So it was like one to two or something like that. Then it was all fine. So uh, what we rendered out was, um, let's see, I'll show you just the renders. See so over here, I have my little folder. Nothing too crazy, but I have, you know, our color render uh, and I have, uh, let me shut all this off. Hold on, I gotta turn this all off. We have our color render, we have our normal render, which we could use to relight the scene or add some lighting if we want to um, here in Photoshop, which we might, I just have an unlit render this is just the raw base color uh, in case we need that for some reason. And then uh, this is what Unreal provides as a world depth render, which is totally broken. Uh, I don't know why it's totally broken. I could write a, sh I was gonna write a post-process shader to actually render a proper depth pass, but then I just didn't get around to it. And I don't really need it for this, so maybe sometime in the future. And then the other thing is it, it, I rendered this all as a single EXR. And so Unreal does provide a way to kind of get like a, an object ID pass. So you can see all these, each layer individually has um, a different selection on it based on either object or material. Uh, like some of them are useful, like this would let me select all the foliage at once. So if I wanted to colorize it instead of like manually doing it, too. I'd say all the foliage at once, but then I also realized now there's rocks on here for some reason, which are neither the same object or the same material. So who knows? Um, but either way, it would still be mostly useful. Um, or maybe that's just because I have something on above. I don't know. Normally what you do is you pack these into what's called like an ID or a clown pass where each one of these selection layers is a different color. Uh, and I could spend the time to do that here, but uh, honestly, I don't think I'm going to wind up using these very much. So I didn't bother. Um, in fact, the EXR uh, plugin I use for Photoshop is supposed to do that automatically and it never works. And I've never figured out why, but there's a little checkbox to say, open your ID material pass as colors and I do and it never works. So just never really dug into it because honestly, I once I get to the painting stage, I just like to paint. I don't like to fiddle with it too much in terms of I don't necessarily go back to the depth pass. If I want some more fog, I just paint it in, you know. So I like the actual act of painting, not just manipulating layers, but I do sometimes. So I do render them out just to have them. Uh, all I've done so far, so that's the renders layer. All I've done so far is I um, separated the sky from the background or so rather the sky from the foreground. So I have this um, sky layer here, which is just, uh, and you see I did a tiny bit of painting, see that? I didn't do much. And that's behind our foreground, which has it cut out. So, you know, that's useful just for doing these kind of big, initially I'll probably start off just by painting my way around the clouds, just getting a little bit of feel for the clouds. And then the other plans I have is introducing maybe some, a little bit of coolness in the darks and the shadow areas, uh, and then painting up our priests and then painting some more foliage and, and detail and color on the uh, tree. And this just giving everything a little more painterly feel. And then the other thing I do is uh, I usually put noise on things. And so I have a couple layers here. Uh, I'll show them to you. Let me get in a little closer here. Uh, so this, I have two noises. So one is this, uh, and I'm gonna turn this just to straight normal. So one is this sort of thing, which is a lithographic crayon texture. And uh, I have it constrained. If you double click on your layers in Photoshop, you have these little ranges, right? Where you can kind of limit it to the gray value underneath. So and if you hold down Alt, you can pull apart those sliders to fade it over that range. So I, I basically have that just in the darker areas just because I want a little more tooth there. It helps blend things. I'll probably turn it down a little bit over time. And then I've got another general noise layer, which over everything, I don't actually, you know, I am constraining it still so that it's not in the very brightest brights. You can see right here. Uh, and this is actually a scan of a uh, 35 millimeter frame of film. So it's a little more organic feeling than just the Photoshop uh, uh, noise. Uh, it's got a little more uh, variety of little blobs and shapes. So I like to use both of those on top of my artwork and I usually turn it down quite a bit. Um, I often leave it off when I'm painting uh, and it's just like something at the end just to kind of, it has a, I love analog feeling things even though my goal isn't to imitate natural media with these paintings not like specifically imitate natural media. I still like a little bit of an analog noisy feeling. So I just usually put it in at small amounts on most everything I do, not everything, especially sometimes if I'm doing like, you know, ink and line work, I won't do it. Or if I'm working with a client and they're like, I don't want it to be noisy, then I don't do it. But otherwise I like to do it. All right, uh, so that's that. So I'm gonna get started doing some painting. And actually I realized that I'm probably gonna actually 
Um, so Photoshop, uh, you know, like I always paint with the F mode on, if you will. That sounds great. But the F mode is like, um, it puts it into this mode here. And the reason for that is, is that it actually is the only mode that lets you fluidly kind of move it, your canvas partially off the page. And that's nice so that like if I want to paint on the bottom, instead of like doing something weird with my arm or moving the Cintiq around, I can just flick it up and kind of work here. So, but that does mean it kind of takes over the whole monitor, which normally is fine because normally I'm, I have, um, you know, my references or whatever uh, in the uh, other layer. And I'm just going to make sure I have everything set up right here because um, it does seem, there we go. Sometimes my walk -on buttons revert. I don't know why. All right, so let's get, let's paint some sky. And as always, folks, feel free to ask any questions and I'm happy to um, talk about anything or in the process or whatever, anything. Ask anything. I don't care. Uh, so, you can see here, the first thing is that these default Unreal clouds are more like cotton balls than clouds. And um, I just want to add a little bit of more drama. I'm not trying to make it too, um, you know, I'm not going for a, uh, a crazy dramatic sky. It's not really the focal point of this, but I do want to add a little more painterly to this. And so I started it, and the way in which I do that, my favorite way to do that, many ways to do that, is I usually just use the mixer brush um, and paint. So um, rather than like use the smudge brush or um, there's a lot of different ways to soften things. I like using, um, I, I use the Deharm brush a, a lot, um, but I, I have my own as well. Uh, they're, they're nothing too distinctive. They're just some nice mixer brush brushes. And the only thing I do is make sure that when you use a mixer brush, which I'm not in the mixer brush. Hold on, I selected the wrong thing. Make it do, do, let me close this, close this. Too many, too many brushes, which I don't use 99% of them. What's up, Anna? Uh, so I always make sure to select sample all layers, which is not on by default for um, mixer brush because it slows things down. But the mixer brush has a nice way of, I'm going to get in a little closer so you can see this because right now I'm working pretty subtly. Um, you know, this is like, for example, really soft here. So I like to sample this and cut back into it and push back and forth. And you can kind of see getting a little more uh, natural paint. And it doesn't have to all be contour. You know, I can kind of go against the grain, if you will as well. Uh, my tip might need to be changed. I use felt tips as well for the Wacom. I, I don't like the default hard plastic ones. I like the felt ones. And the only problem is that I also, um, uh, I've always pressed way too hard when I draw and I get, you know, I quite often get neck and um, arm cramps uh, and I can't help it. Uh, I always just press really hard. I have uh, too much hand strength, I guess. I don't know. So I, uh, <laughs> that sounded like some weird humble brag. Uh, that's the weirdest flex ever, an artist talking about their hand strength. Uh, so it, it um, anyways, uh, I, but I use these uh, felt tips and it um, screws things up a little bit. Like they get smashed in, so I have to change them more often, but they have a great tooth. Now you can see what's happening here is I have sample all layers on, right? And because I have sample all layers on, it's picking up the stuff in front of it, the colors and doing that, which sometimes you want. Right now I don't want it. So I can hear this, I can hear this, uh, uh, this felt tip starting to go. I might need to replace it. Yeah, maybe replace it. That's a little smash. Can you guys see that a little smash? I'm going to see if I can have another one here. What's up, frozen basalt? I promise not to make too many geology jokes this time. Too many. Maybe one or two. One or two. I got to open my little, uh, my little collection of Wacom tips here and see if I have another one. I think that's one. Yeah, it looks like it. We got one more, at least. Anyways, I don't really modify the Wacom stuff too much, but I do like these felt tips a lot more than uh, the default hard plastic ones. So anyways, when I'm doing this sort of work, I don't really want to pick up those three colors. You can turn off sample all layers, which in my case means I'm gonna to have to merge these sky layers, which is fine. I don't really care. But see now when I'm sampling and using my mixer brush, I'll just do it dramatically real quick. See, it's not grabbing those tree colors. So you can kind of jump back and forth. Uh, my one wish for the mixer brush, in addition to just being faster, um, is sometimes I like to have like a really big wide brush. Like, uh, you know, it'd be hard to be Bob Ross with the mixer brush because it, it's, um, it's too slow for these sort of big brush moves without it, um, if you're working at any high res whatsoever. Would be one is faster and two, I'd love if um, it had the same, so like your normal eyedropper tool has, um, 
has you can sample all layers or you can sample current and below or no adjustments i wish the mixer brush had those same options um, instead of just sample all layers or no, you know just the current layer that would be very useful to me anyways because i do like to work in layers and non-destructively to some extent instead of just flat i mean ultimately it probably gets all flattened down but it's nice to have that all right so i'm just filling my way around here and i do want to put a little more color into these but right now I'm just going to try and make these edges a little more defined and a little more interesting. I don't want to get too volumetric because it's still, at least in this painting, and I don't really zoom in that much. I just did that to show you that. This painting is, it's not, it's not really a focal point. It's not trying to be like, you know, the world's sexiest clouds or anything. Uh, but I just don't like the cotton puff balls that come out of um, Unreal by default. And I didn't take the time to write a new volumetric um, material for the cloud, so knowing I was going to paint it anyways. So I'm just kind of mixing it up a bit. Oh, that's interesting. So you can see what happened here is I, um, I had put a little brown onto this layer. So even though it's not, um, can I get in a little, let me get in a little closer. So you can see a little bit better. Uh, yeah, so I got a little brown coming in off here and it's breaking these edges up. It's actually just an illusion in terms of like this, it's actually just behind it. But because I put some of there in there when I'm kind of sampling, it's sampling that even though it's not sampling the foreground. So I can still kind of work non-destructively um, and get some of that feel. So I could, you know, I could go up here. You could also switch layers, say sample this color, go back down and do it that way as well. Uh, however you want to work, but I at least try to work non-destructively for a while. I work really non-destructively if it's like for a work assignment or something like that instead of just my um, my own personal bullshit. Just because it makes changes so much easier. More flexibility and it almost always, you know, someone almost always wants something changed. That is the job. All right. How's everyone doing this Sunday? Anyone got anything going on? I realize that it is, uh, I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, some people celebrate the Easter thing. Just happy Easter to those who you celebrate that. Uh, as a dirty atheist, I celebrate nothing. I'm just kidding. I, I mean, I, you know, secularly, I celebrate things like, I don't know, Christmas. But only because it's such a bizarre concept. How's it golden, Mooster? How's it going, going golden, Mooster? We're painting some sky. I'm actually zoomed way too far in, but I just wanted to at least show you that. I'm trying to pull some color in here now. The most common thing to add to sky would be a little orange in the clouds. It usually works as a near complement of whatever your, your sky blue color is pretty nicely. Kind of more on the shadow side in my case, but you know, there's no rule. Or if there is, you should ignore it. Easter, over, Easter, Passover, Ramadan, and a flamen. Yeah, you see? This goes to show you my exposure is mainly to Easter, uh, just because I tend to be surrounded by that more often. But uh, yes, you're right. There's a lot more going on than just Easter. So happy all of them to whoever cares. Glad to hear it, Golden. Is anyone working on any um, projects they want to talk about, share, brainstorm? <laughs> Quite often, some of you folks are working on some cool stuff. Games or art or costumes. I think I'm going to put a little more orange over here, maybe. That's a lot more orange. It's all right. It's actually sometimes nice with the mixer brush to introduce a bit more color because you can. It's pretty easy to pull it back just by blending in. So, you know, it doesn't hurt to experiment. Just be bold, right? Why not? Okay. See how I can easily paint that back a little bit just by blending it out. Oh, cool, DJ. Okay, and it's still a secret, right? You haven't talked about what it is. 
It's not Elvira yet, is it? Because, see, the reason why I want to know if it's Elvira is because we talked about when you did your Elvira, I would have to do my um, Zardos. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to <laughs> do a Zardos outfit. <laughs> Campy mess. Excellent. All right. I'm waiting for the Elvira. I got, I got to prepare it though. I'll, well, then I'm, then I'm committed to doing Zardoz. Just need like a year to get in shape. <laughs> Let's get a little. Just getting a feel for things. A little color in here. It's always fun to keep a copy of your original so you could like quickly alt click to the original so you can kind of see if some of the choices you made are improving it. So you see I'm adding just a little more, oops, not that. Um, adding just a little more color. Let's see, what was I doing? This is what I was trying to do, yeah. That's the original. Here's where I'm at at the moment. Just adding a little more color and interest in the sky, hopefully. <laughs> also, it's always good to remember I was fine. Like sometimes I get in digital painting, I get super, if I zoom in or whatever, I get super um, making small little uh, fiddly controls that are, um, um, are fiddly brush strokes that are all at the like same frequency and it leads to a really uh, unsatisfying thing to look at. Uh, so you gotta, at least I find that. Uh, I don't tend to do that if I'm painting traditionally, but for whatever reason digitally, I would be more likely to do that. Uh, so I try to just, you know, force myself to increase the brush size every once in a while or pull back or just do a bigger stroke. What's up? Plot. Okay, how am I supposed to say Pilot? Is it Pilot or Plot? I could just say, I could say Pavel, but how's it going, man? Uh, I'm. You're right. I do need to add a little blue, and I was planning on adding a little blue. You are right. I was trying to decide the tone of the blue, because I do want to add, I want a little um, more blue in here, but I want also, um, uh, I don't want to get it, I'm trying to stay in that kind of golden feel. And I do want to save a little room. That looks pretty good, though. I do want to save a little room for the uh, shadows to get a little bluer. Maybe I should play with that soon. Oh, I like that. Have a lot. As in Camelot. It's probably, is there no relation there? Probably. <laughs> How's the game coming? How's the game coming, Pavel? I was in crap a lot. Well, you know, it's fine. I'm not going to judge. That sounds like something I shouldn't kink shame you about. Half as good, half as well. You know, that's better than most. So. <laughs> hmm. Working on the meh. That's, yeah, that's like most creative projects. How's it coming? Well, you know, trying to improve the meh. Oh, you know, another thing that I tend to do, as do most digital painters that I haven't done yet, is, uh, and there are more accurate ways to do this, but this is good enough for me, is to give yourself a layer above, set it to black, put it to color, prefer you can do saturation, or you can have a more advanced, let, and that'll just let you look at your value range, make sure everything's readable, because um, human brains get confused by color, and the readability is pretty good. We'll see how it develops as I move forward. I've left a little headroom for the, um, uh, you know, like the orb and stuff and whatever these uh, priests are going to turn into to, to get a little more prominent if we want. So there's still room for that. All right, and then now that I turn that on and off, uh, I actually think these, these clouds are too fiddly, too cowardly. No need for cowardice in digital painting because you can just undo it, put on a layer. I'm not sure. All right. Now, 
all. So now I'm on the top layer. I'm going to see if I can sample all stuff. I'm going to, this is probably too big of a brush. I just want to sort of soften some of this. So it's softened more in a painterly way and less in a video game linear fog sort of way. Which involves, you guessed it, painting instead of blurring or over painting a certain uniform color. The rule of thirds, it is true. Rule of thirds is a pretty good rule for at least for cinematic presentations. You know, I didn't actually check it per se. It's probably, it's probably, yeah, but you know, there you go. So focal points are pretty much in line here. We got one plane there and one plane here. Yeah, pretty close. All right, let's see what happens if I'm going to try I'm putting a layer here. This is just a quick test, really. Let's just fill this layer, and I'm going to constrain it to the layer below. And I'm going to first say, uh, constrain yourself only to the darkest regions of this image. Just blend out. And then let us try. I'm going to do a couple different blend modes here. I might have to do something a little more. It's kind of the wrong color right now, but let's. I like to just throw almost any color in there and then use, when I'm doing color correction like this, just to kind of use sliders to play with it instead of, um, instead of spending too much time finding the right color uh, as a paint swatch. So what did I do there? You can see, let me zoom in a little bit, maybe you can see. Let's see. Yeah, so I was just wanting to introduce um, some little cools here, and you can see um, what I did is just, it's non destructive. I'll probably bake all this down. And if I don't like it, if it's taking up too much of the image, of course I can just paint in this and get variety that way, but you can also uh, play with where it starts to fade in and where it starts to cut off just by adjusting these sliders, just based on the underlying gray value. So see what I did there? If I move it this way, it'll start to affect more of the image. Let me zoom out so you can see it. So what we've done here is see how it's now coming, spilling up, uh, which actually I think I like better than I thought I would. Uh, it's maybe a little much, um, but definitely adds a little more depth to it, at least to my eye. But it's a little strong as it starts to get out of line. Well, I'm happy to hear that, Golden Mister. Yeah, I mean, you know, I... I, I know there's a million people doing streams and probably people who are much better at it than myself and put a lot more effort into it, but I'm happy if it at least makes <laughs> someone inspired to make something. It's nice to hear. All right. Uh, but do, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's more depth. I like that more depth. There's this brings more color. It doesn't really change our value structure too much. Yeah. It's almost identical, but it does, um, it does add some more interest in areas like, um, like, uh, like, you know, this area here. Oh my gosh. I see, I'm still in the mixer brush. See what happens when you use the mixer brush quickly or in a large area. Uh, and that is why I was complaining earlier that it needs to be faster. Get on that Adobe. All right. Take all of my creative cloud money and do something cool. All right. The other thing I could try here is we could try, um, let's see. I don't really want to put a lot of pink into this image, but <clears throat> cause you know, it's too much of a clutch for me. But I'm gonna try and um, I'm gonna try and do a similar thing with the highlights in a different blend mode, and let's see where it gets it gets us if we like it. It might be maybe more of a um, peach color than that. So we're gonna do the opposite, right? So now we're gonna go just to the brighter parts, and I definitely don't like it on the sky. So I'm gonna constrain it to just the foreground. Okay, so for which I can do just by alt clicking that layer. And now we're just to the foreground because the way I've separated our layers. Thank you, Hannah. Hopefully, you know, it might go through a few ugly stages here, but you know, we'll we'll get it. So you gotta be gotta gotta be a little ugly. So let's see. Yeah, so you see what I'm doing there is it's, I don't know if you can see it, just in those highlights. Uh, I don't like this color, but uh, what I do, like I said, I usually just like to throw a color down, and I much rather judge these things with analog sliders uh, than by color picking and filling. So um, what am I doing here? I'm just playing with. See, I'm trying to see if I want, I'm just trying to push the orange, orangeness around some of our, um, some of our crystal ball. 
and a little bit on the tree and I don't know if I like it I'm just just playing with it and I don't really like it so I think uh, it, I mean it looks okay you could make it work but I'm not going to make it work because I the, the, the contributions it has I'm gonna do with paint um, just manually in the areas where I want it versus like a broader color all right so now I think that's good for just the broad color correction so now I'm going to do some actual painting again um, and I think what I want to try and do before I paint the foreground too much is um, look at our priest color and stuff and I'm not sure I, I kind of still may be thinking I don't remember if you I did this painting a long time ago let's see if I can find it uh, just just that's in kind of a little bit in my mind that might be a good reference point okay, let's go to my ye old Lee Petty website because I'm Clearly, I should be more organized locally, but if I go to like uh, pilgrimage, I think it's um, let me scroll through this a bit. Yeah, like a conjuring sort of thing, exactly. Well, where are we at? Do, do, do. Let me keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I think these are too red. These characters are too red, but yeah, somewhere. If you, if you look close, there's a little bit of crimson in these characters it's played down because the saturation is pretty low but i think i just want to maybe introduce a little bit of that in there again so i might i might do it i might do it let's see here do i have any other reference i care to look at um yeah i don't see like this isn't quite a summoning or a conjuring because the thing's there but i think maybe it's like an awakening you know Maybe like this thing's been going for a while. Maybe they've seeded it, maybe not. But now they're gathering and it's maybe awakening a bit more. So there is a there is something going on there. Uh, I'm looking for, I thought I had some reference of stuff I was interested in, but maybe I don't. Yeah, not really. It's kind of looking here on my second monitor. If it looks like I'm staring off into space, I'm not actually having a cascade failure. I have fully recovered. From my yeah gatherings gatherings conspiracies you know honestly part of it is uh, part of it is uh, it's more interesting compositionally to work with you know multiples and like I love just doing character design and working on single images but like when I'm trying to do a full composition I try and make sure I'm challenging myself to not just like draw a single character not that I don't love it but I almost love it too much so I don't let myself do it because I feel like it I don't grow enough so. That's why I've been doing a lot more, um, you know, sort of landscape. I think <laughs> there were like 10 years, I only did like vertical compositions, uh, which is actually really terrible for social media. But, you know, not that I really give a shit, but, you know, I do think about it a little bit, if I'm honest. All right, so I'm just going to, uh, so you can see what happens if I just start putting down this mixer brush, it's just gonna wipe this whole thing away. Uh, so I'm gonna switch to a non-mixer brush brush initially, just to kind of feel my way around it. Um, and then we could go back and add some of that in there if we want. So, uh, all right, we'll see. Just gonna not think about it too much. I'm gonna stay pretty pulled out. May design these characters a little bit more later, but right now, just wanna get a little bit more color in here. And I'm kind of overpainting this uh, tree that's in front of them. Uh, I can subtract that out because I have a saved selection for that. So I can fix that up after I drop this color in if I want. Let's get back a little. I'm going to pull some of this purple in here on the shadow side. A little bit dark. Definitely a little bit saturated. But that's all right. I'm gonna start more saturated and I'm gonna to tone it back a little bit. Because red, red doesn't really travel that far as a color. These things are in the distance, so it kind of loses its saturation pretty quickly. Not again, not that I'm really aiming for any sort of super realistic take on color and lighting, but just a random thing to think about. All right, so I'm just getting the color in and then I think I'm gonna do, I don't, I don't want them to all have staffs. That was just kind of like the model I had, or at least, you know, maybe I could always, like, if I wanted it to be more specific compositionally, like right now the staff is coming out of his head, which isn't that great. 
And of course, there's the joke that all concept art has a dude with a walking stick in it. And the reason for that is it's like it's much easier to like, you know, compositionally, if you're just like, hey, here's an arrow, look here, right? <laughs> then I'm sure we've all seen those drawings where people are like, yes, you have to do this and this. Actually, my favorite terrible thing is when artists do these composition workflows that are complete bullshit, that are just them thinking through it, but they're like, well, you have a line here, and then this line intersects this line, and this point hits him, and then this goes back up here, and then I've done that. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's not really how eyes work, because I think you see an image simultaneously, and although you can certainly do certain things compositionally to help or hurt that, I just don't feel it's like quite that linear and breakdown, and it's a little over literal interpretation of composition. There's just so many other things in there. I, I just, I don't know. I find it a little obnoxious that it's presented as, a, as though it's a simple rule. And you just gotta like move these little lines around. But you know what? If it works, great. Who cares? Uh, I'm, yeah, I think I'm gonna get rid of some of this. Repringling. Yes, the repling, replingling. That, that was the, wasn't that, that was just like a, a fake compositional device that people. <laughs> Still in the mixer brush, not good. Yeah. So what I'm doing now is I'm just maybe getting rid of this staff in his head. I do find that a little awkward compositionally, so I'm just just painting it out. I could go and find a selection set for it, but I don't. Yeah, just paint it out. Or if I was really unhappy with the way this was looking, I could just sample some of these leaves back in here like that, and I never tell a difference. Easy. Art is just lines. Actually, art isn't lines at all, really. Even though I love lines. Uh, Art. It's like, you know what, an easier path to getting people into your images is actually almost always form, not lines. But a lot of us grow up with comic books and anime and other things that are very line-based mediums, originally because of technical limitations, among other things. And so it, it, it totally, uh, I don't know, I think it's how a lot of us like to draw, myself included. But yeah, no, it's a much harder way about it than just drawing in form and shape if you're trying to actually... Anyways, uh, you know what? I don't really have a strong opinion about any of it. It's just interesting. It's just interesting. I just think there's, you're just gonna have to try a lot of stuff. There's just more factors than uh, can be expressed in simple formulas. I'm just looking at that color from a distance. All right, I'm going to just merge those two layers. How would I def describe the difference between former lines? Well. Uh, from an art standpoint, I would say that um, line is what you'd expect, right? It's lines don't really exist in real life, uh, you know, when your eye is looking at something. I mean, okay, this is slightly not true, but let's just say for the moment when you look at something, most of what you're actually seeing is tone, is, is value, uh, and you're seeing forms rendered in light. Like, you don't have shape or form without light, right? So, uh, painters... Not always, and there's like, as moment you say anything in art, within two seconds, someone immediately tells you, well, there's actually this, and like, yes, yes. We're just gonna talk about, generally speaking, because there's always exceptions, especially in art. But generally speaking, painters are more concerned about communicating and rendering form, volume, you know, dimensionality. A lot of painting, at least traditionally, was is, um, is uh, trying to provide the illusion. Um, and that's done primarily through form more than line. Line, if you want to think of like an ink drawing, is, um, you know, is effectively like running a, a really high contrast filter on your vision <laughs> to find those edges. And then like things about the line itself, the character of the line itself can imply certain things. So usually if you have a thicker line, for a lot of people that'll read as a shadow side versus a highlight side, right? So you can still communicate some sense of lighting and volume for sure. And not to mention things like cast shadows and lines being thinner in the background will look like they're fading away in the atmosphere versus really dark lines, which will advance the, in, the, in the picture frame. So you can certainly still use both techniques, either simultaneously but to, to communicate. But generally speaking, drawing is more concerned about line or at least uh, more so than, say, painting. But of course, like I said, there's exceptions. It's not just about the medium itself, especially when you're talking about digitally. You're like, well, what is that? Digital's neither. So um, uh, I like to draw. That was like the first thing I did more than painting. And I still really like to draw. But drawing, like, if you want to render a really nice image and lines and drawing, 
I think it's much more time consuming. If you're trying to be at all representing volume or illusion, it's much more time consuming than using a simple shape um, with proper uh, lighting. And it's, in, it's, it's really hard to describe, but um, uh, you can find, like I often find like, um, like you'll see like little thumbnails of people's work and when it's like a painting or uh, you know, approached in a more painterly way. And they can be very, very compelling even though there's almost no detail there. But um, it's very hard to do that with lines. Um, so, yeah. But the reality is, of course, with a lot of commercial work or modern work, there's a, there's a mixture of both in there, right? So, um, but you know, you can, uh, when you're painting, what you really want to do is focus on putting values next to each other to communicate form and create contrast and interest more than, let's say, drawing an outline around everything. You can if you're going for like a comic look, but um, you know, it can look, uh, it can look very outline-y, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was a super great description, but it's hard to do without visual aids, I think. Uh, I'm going to desaturate this a little bit, which I am saturating it. I thought I picked desaturate. Yeah, so what I'm doing now is just checking my value contrast. Generally, and the reason why do visual artists do this, and, the, and of course you have a huge cheat advantage when you're a digital artist. It's much easier to do this than when you're doing traditional art. Um, but uh, the reason for that is, generally speaking, um, if your image, so first of all, understand human eyes suck when it comes to both value and color, but especially when they see both, your eyes get super confused. And whether something works well or not, quite often is, let's just say it's about both, but, but Quite often, if it works well from a value structure standpoint, it it's uh, it it can work with a variety of different color schemes. But quite often, the the opposite isn't true. At the very least, it's helpful to your eye to put this on, uh, like this sort of thing, so you can look at your image in grayscale and not um, see the influence color has. Of course, color has influence because you know this red color being unique in the picture right now draws more compositional prominence, even though its value structure it doesn't pop way out. So, you know, you kind of have to look at both, but it is nice, like if your image is uh, feeling um, ambiguous or you don't know uh, what's going on, it quite often is uh, the values. So you can look at the values, look at it in uh, black and white, grayscale, not black and white, and that can help you determine that. Uh, I mean, people, you know, there's all sorts of techniques. It's just one really simple one. The other one that people do a lot is the uh, canvas flip, right? Which is like flipping your image the other way, because what that does is it refreshes your eyes and then you can see, does, does the composition still work from this side? And this is not usually a problem when rendering is involved in the process, like, like I used, I kind of rendered this face. Quite often it's a problem when it's just drawing or painting um, all manual because what happens is, you know, we usually have a hand preference. Sometimes we hold our head a certain way or at a certain angle and you're only kind of looking at it and then you're, you're have actually having proportion or compositional flaws that you don't notice and flipping it uh, is a way of doing that. So when I used to do a lot of traditional art, I would just like hold up my painting or drawing to a mirror and uh, it would perform a similar function. Or, you know, it's kind of one of the functions of a camera obscura back in uh, history, right? Like, I mean, it did other things as well, but it, it kind of like as a way of seeing, uh, you know, three dimensional world projected onto a 2D surface and as another way of like refreshing your eyes. So it can be helpful sometimes to, if you have the option to kind of like work in one mode for a while and kind of go back and forth. All right, I'm just kind of hopping back and forth here, seeing what I want to do with this guy. Questions? I don't know. I've really thought about it too much. I might just doodle a little bit on him. So, uh, speaking of lines, so I'll just keep it backwards for now. So, speaking of lines, so I might just grab, I use this, this is one of the brushes I made a long time ago. It's this weird sort of brush I use I use it like for pen and ink a lot too but um, it's kind of nice like what I'll do sometimes and I haven't figured it like I haven't really figured out what I want the design of these guys to be and I don't want these lines necessarily to stay around but uh, it can be helpful for me contrary to just what I said about rendering form I'm just sort of trying to figure out what I want this character to be I don't know if I want to have some more prominent masks on his face. 
This just kind of lets me doodle on a layer above it. And then if I like some of it, if I don't like, I can just redraw it or delete it. And if I do like some of it, what I can do is um, uh, merge, you know, paint on top of it, merge it down, smudge it, all the above. Just thinking, all right, he's connected to this tree in some way, so maybe I'll give him some little, little branchy bits. Kind of, sort of. Nothing over it, just a little. That one's a little over it. <laughs> Let's erase in this real quick. Too much. So if you're kind of doing like a more traditional painting, you might have like a... <laughs> Or, you know, like analog meat space. If you're doing a painting in meat space, you might actually have like a, a transparent overlay that you're putting on top of your drawing to check the drawing and then lifting it up and painting, you know, kind of restoring the proportions. Because traditional painting, that one of the things I, I hate about traditional painting... <laughs> okay, the stuff I love about it is it's such so nice and visceral and um, feels great to do. The stuff I hate about it is that if you actually are working towards a specific drawing, you like constantly paint so opaque. Most form of painting is opaque, so you wind up... You end up wiping out your drawing a lot and then having to repaint those lines then repaint again or having to have a reference sheet and redraw them so just to get your base colors down whereas you know it's so much easier to do digitally and it's so fast and it's like that's not the fun part of painting to me is not like reestablishing your drawing once you've got your base values in that's just like the labor stuff that i don't care for i'm sure some people really love it that part of it i don't like I, uh, I was just randomly thinking about Sid Mead uh, this weekend, and uh, he passed away not too long ago. Uh, the visual futurist who designed, you know, among other things, Blade Runner and Tron, and, um, you know, <laughs> was pretty much inventing a huge chunk of the cyberpunk look, or what would later on become a huge influence in it. We'll say it that way. So uh, I was just thinking about him because I bought a video of his before he died uh, many years ago off of, I think, Nomon. And it was him using, showing his traditional painting process. Traditional as in like using gouache. And, you know, he has very tightly controlled paintings with great, um, lots of perspective, for example, and hard surface details of which can be challenging with any, anything, but especially like, I think especially maybe traditional painting. So he shows his sort of process for that. Yeah, it's a lot of, uh, you know, getting the drawing right. I slipped this back. Getting the drawing right. So you see, I just have this on a, um, of course, no, I was a mistake. I was talking instead of thinking about what I was doing, and I did actually just draw it right onto the same layer. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I will just paint, I'll paint it down, but uh, that <laughs> that's not what I meant to do. I meant to have it on the layers so I could turn it on and off. That's all right. Um, anyways, it was, it was a great, it's a great video. Um, watching him work. And uh, one of the things he does is what you'd expect with, you know, gouache is kind of a, a finicky media. It's easy to use, I think, overall, but it dries darker than when you're uh, using it, which makes it a, a bit of a pain. Um, it dries pretty quickly, but it's still kind of a pain in that regard. And uh, the other thing it, it does is, um, just trying to get the color right here. It's a little too saturated. Just give me a minute. Sometimes it's hard to talk. Uh, I don't know, he's talking about gouache. Well, he pre-mixes his, his value structure, these little cups, and keeps them around. And then he's got like a, um, he's got like a, uh, a transparent piece of paper, like we'll call it tracing paper, which has his original drawing on it. And he's got it, he's got it registered to his painting surface. So as he, as he paints and covers up some of his drawing lines, he needs those back. So he knows how to paint what he wants to paint. He'll flip it up and flip it down. And then like, you know, redraw those lines over and over to kind of like the area is working on. And uh, I remember doing not quite that exact process, but I remember having to do that that sort of thing a lot when I was uh, um, doing more traditional painting. And it's a pain in the ass. I don't I don't enjoy it at all. <laughs> Anyways, don't really have to do that with uh, the digital. Just use a layer, or unless you're talking like I am and you mess it up. It is exhausting. Traditional painting is a lot of really exhausting things about it. But the thing about it that is magical is the actual, like, just phys like the physicality of the materials, the feeling of dragging paint across canvas and, and all that. It is, it is 
seductive. It's hard to it's hard to recreate digitally. As much as I love digital art, um, it's 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 wonderful. And some you know some people I think are really into that that aspect of it, um, which is totally understandable. But I do think there's more. Um, do you think there's more, it's more labor intensive for things that are probably not just about the art? Obviously you could argue the process is a big part of the art and I'd agree with that, but I think there's just a lot like, oh, my paint's dried out, I need to remix that paint. Or I gotta clean up my brushes. There's all that sort of stuff that for me, I didn't enjoy. And so I like not having to do that even though I miss the physicality of the paint and the painting process. <laughs> Should never feel guilty about that. All right, so there's where I was, and this is where that is, and it's not looking great um, in my thing, and I think it's because I'm talking too much for doing this sort of work. <laughs> I think it's one thing for me to paint colors, but so when I'm doing design work, I find it very hard, and I'm kind of basically doing design work there, uh, but I'm going to see if I can restore a little bit of it just with, um, uh, I'm just going to try and use some oil paint on top of it and see where I get. This one. Sample all layers. Am I on a layer above it? Yeah, more or less. Yeah, because uh, I wouldn't normally put such strong lines there, but I did that just to sort of say, oh yeah, you can design this way and then turn them off once you start painting, once you sort of figure it out. And of course, I put them into my thing exactly. So I think I'm probably just going to wind up erasing this. But that's okay. That's what like digital art is <laughs> there's no reason not to experiment right like why not try it it's not gonna hurt us worst case i just redo that layer no big deal it's very blurry now and i'm just sort of smooshing it around a little bit just to see if i like any aspect of it i don't know that i even really like pillar to be honest with you I think I am going to erase this work on the priest for now and come back to it because I don't like it um, and I didn't mean to merge it. Uh, so I'm going to just select this and delete and delete and it's gone. No big deal. Normally I just would have a layer I'd turn off, but I just decided to delete it. And I want to I want to work on something else. It's not working for me right now, so I want to work on some other aspect of this. Okay, so there are a few really um, simple things I want to do, which is just to go through and um, I'm going to use my oil, oil paint brush here. And I'm going to break up these these uh, CG edges, as we call them. They're too hard and perfect around here. So I'm just, you know, that's a real simple way thing to do with a mixer brush is you can just make sure you're sampling all your layers. It's going to get in here. And, you know, you can, you still like gesture and other things still count. So you can definitely, you don't want to just, at least I don't just want to blur it. Um, but I just want to give it a more uh, organic feeling edge. Similarly, some of these, and I'll probably paint a little bit more grass and moss in here. Um, similarly, some of the way some of these things are shaded in here is not satisfying. Um, and a little too, I don't know, a little too artificial feeling. Let's say it that way. So I'll probably paint in on some of these as well while I'm here. I'm not really going to worry about masking anything out for the most part. I'm just going to get in here and make some happy little trees. So Valley Dweller, how are things? How was the land of miniature painting? You see a little bit more I'm doing if I get in a little bit closer. You can see just like, just those little gestures in here make those shapes a little more interesting. Only a couple left. Are you doing all the Elden Ring bosses? I mean, I guess I don't even know in Elden Ring what qualifies as a boss in some cases. <laughs> like, how big is the list you're working on? I guess that's that's I can see it that way, right?
<laughs> yeah, I have, I've been a little bit off the uh, Elden Ring track. Uh, I gotta get back into it. Which, it's not the easiest game to get back into after you've played it for a while and moved away from it because then you forget all the little things that you sort of had in progress because the game doesn't really track them for you, which is totally fine, but I'm not going to bust out a fucking journal for it. I got more important things to do <laughs> in life. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. I, um, this is the first one I've re I've enjoyed as much as I had. I, I I have. I've enjoyed moments of the other ones, but they were definitely a little more um, of a butt stab corridors. Whereas I feel like this one feels these feel much more like a world to me, and there's more much more like a world, and there's more to, for me to do than just uh, you know fight one encounter over and over trying to get to the unadvertised save point. Um, feel like uh, there's just this feels a little more organic in terms of moving around and I, I'm enjoying it more I know it's not everyone enjoys it as much as uh, like some people like the Elburns better which is totally fine but for me this combo is working a little bit better so I'm not necessarily painting these look more rock like per se I might, I might add a little bit of fine texture in here but what I'm primarily doing is just like there's there's some softness in the form and some um, some laziness in the shading and it's just because the maybe the models weren't as crisp as they could be or the lighting's not as accurate as it could be and most painters will uh, simplify their value structure when rendering form so there's not like uh, tons and tons of gradients throughout it they'll kind of break it down and so to some extent just by painting painting out some of those softer gradients it makes the form feel more intentional uh, at least it does for me uh, in addition to just like getting rid of some of these CG edges uh, what I'm doing there and I think it really helps just memeing <laughs> wow uh, are you playing the character class where you're basically fighting naked is that is that something is that a thing you're still doing or is that you Sorry, I just had to have some coffee. Some caffeine. Just because I was like, why would I like to sleep tonight? Sleeping's overrated. Not really. Don't listen to me. Sleeping's not overrated. Sleeping's important. I'm just not good at it. Trying to just make some of these these shapes and these forms feel a little more intentional, a little less artifacts of me using an alpha and Z brush, sort of. <laughs> some of these have a little more value contrast than I want in here, um, the way I'm painting them down, but um, that's a temporary thing. A mixer brush will, oftentimes I'll start with a stronger um, contrast because when I just go back and blend it in it, smooshes it all out thanks Jeremy I appreciate it I'm trying I'm trying not to go too uh, too nutty on the colors on this one just trying to wiggle in a little bit of color and keeping it keeping it a little more toned back than some of my other more uh, acid colored work it's a little quieter I guess it is a little quieter push this up a bit I think it's been a little too uh there we go it's been a little too flat and weird there similarly like I think this side is turned away from the sun even though we have a lot of bounce line in here see just by adding a more specific direction away from the sun in there i.e a little more it's value contrast, but not, it's more shadow side contrast. I think it, you know, that, I think it just turned this off and you can see the difference there. It's not really drawing more attention to itself, really, a little bit, but it's just feeling a little more intentional in its form, which I think is just what I'm trying to do here. It's not a big focal point or anything. Let's look for those little operators. Those, I know over time working out with 3D, those are the sort of 
things that wind up happening a lot in 3D rendering that uh, I think I would make those choices if I were painting this traditionally. So I feel like I want to go back and fix those when I see them. Now this thing um, could use a little more separation. This side of the tree here could use a little more separation from some of the background. And if I had saved out a depth channel, if Unreal's depth channel rendering wasn't completely totally broken. Well, it's not the rendering, it's the shader. The include doesn't work. Um, <laughs> then uh, I uh, I'd probably have that channel. But what, it, what I'll do here is I just need to find, I'm sure I have a selection of just the, um, just the tree. Let's play with this color here a little bit. That I could grab and use that. And I will do that. Just a little pop or two of color in here. I also have this brush I made ages ago, which is just like these little grass brushes. And I made this these off of um, uh, these off of my ink drawings I did and then scanned them in to turn them into brushes. So they're very much like my my hand, I guess you'd say. So uh, they're pretty subtle. You can see it just there a little bit, and they have a little color variation built into them. So I try and use those a little bit, just to kind of whittle them in to uh, some of my, uh, when I need a little extra foliage or something, just to add a little, I don't know, a little more of how I would paint them. Or, you know, I'm not gonna do a lot here, just a little, little bit. In some cases, it can just be more of the silhouette than the color, because it's kind of in the shadow side. So there's not a lot of color that would probably be coming through there anyways. And I'll probably incorporate some more of that sort of thing on the tree too. But three numbers. Somebody, yeah, you guys do it. You guys, you guys pick it. I don't want to. I don't want to be responsible for whatever terrible thing happens. <laughs> I don't want Mooster to hate me, so someone else pick his numbers. I said he again, and I, I know you told me before you preferred Brona, and if I got it wrong, I apologize. I don't remember. I'm bad with names. All right, All right fine. Uh, I'll pick a number. 13, 69, hmm, 99. How about that? <laughs> I don't, I, is that... You probably told me specifically not to pick those numbers. I just glanced over there. So we grab this. Jeremy's are better. Valley Dweller wins. I'm trying to sneak a little bit of this blue green color in here because I do, I think I'm going back to the original sketch that I like when I had it in some of the leaves that way. So I'm going to probably get back in there. Yeah, see, I am out, often out of bounds. You're right. That's only because we're using halves. <laughs> All right, stupid jokes, stupid graphics jokes. Don't tell anyone, but my strength is not necessarily following the exact rules. So, all right. Uh, okay, so what I want to do now is I want to get a little of that contrast in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and look in my selections, see if I have any that are just a tree, because I'm pretty sure I do. Let's see if I can spot it in a thumbnail. I think it's this one. Bam, look at that. All right, so I'm just going to, just so I don't have to 
dive to this selection set anymore. I'm just going to go and put it in as an alpha. Except I selected the wrong layer. Now, what I can do is I can select this, go back up to our our painting, and uh, I will go ahead and invert my selection. I don't need this, I need to keep this around a lot, but I will put it on another layer so I can evaluate whether I like it or not. So let's go ahead and put it up here. I'll grab a softish brush for now. And I'll simply sample some of the background color around here, paint some of this in just to um, separate this tree a little bit. And of course, I'm now sampling the background color I painted in earlier. So it's not just uh, the render, it's like the blue tones and other things I put in the uh, thing. The thing, I speak well when I paint the stuff. Part of this is about value, but part of it's just about um, the high frequency detail of those tree leaves right be behind these are maybe a little uh, distracting to what's going on on the tree. And I don't need them there. So I'm gonna just, just reducing the value contrast by increasing the value, which if you, if you go here, we turn on off my painting, you can see that the value has gotten lighter and there are also less contrast in the area and therefore it's not as distracting, right? So now, see, our eye goes to that tree and it may, it may be a little strong and then we can always turn it back. But if you zoom back, you can kind of see it there. The, so the tree as a subject is uh, standing out a bit more, which is what we want. And I can soften that or I can make it be more painterly if I want. Um, so I could go back in and like subtly erase some of this. Uh, or I could go back in with the mixer brush later just kind of make it feel a little bit more like painting if I want to. Yeah, I always play at halflings. I like playing halflings. I play halflings. The last halfling I played uh, a few years ago in a campaign was named The Scallion. It was a halfling uh, rogue. I always play rogues or thieves. Please don't judge me. That's just how I'm how I am. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it was the scallion. The scallion. I'm also uh, uh, putting a little more saturation in, in the atmosphere around the tree, just because I do want to um, have a little bit more blue green near them. I don't want to get too crazy with the color. I just want, I'm just ramping it up a little bit. The idea is being like, you know, this thing's maybe a little bit more verdant than the other trees and its surroundings. Like there's a little, there's something going on here, a little life. Ah, excellent. Sorry, Golden. I will do my best to remember it. I am, I am, uh, I, I thought, I felt like I was using the wrong one, but I couldn't quite remember because I am really bad with uh, names and things associated with names. So. It's funny, in general, I have a really good memory, but I've never been great about remembering people's names and that sort of stuff. So. Combat roller skating. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, so I might, yeah, and I might, what I might do too is um, I might, oh, it's being saved already. I think I hit the save. I hit save too much. I'm like save, 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 save. Um, I might. Um, I want to add some more foliage on the tree itself, but the foliage is there. I might tint to be more in that teal range, kind of going back to our original sketch that I liked. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find that selection, which whew, let's see how long it's going to take me. I might just have to, because um, that's going to be a small detail. This is why I could be more organized, but I think this. Yeah, I don't think it's included. I don't think it'll be in that one now. That'll be our other more bo boring foliage. How about this one? No. Just getting a sense. It's probably one of these little tiny ones that I could totally not see just by looking at the thumbnail. Yeah, I could be more organized. I said I probably wouldn't use it. Oh, look at that. Not too bad. Didn't take too long to find that. I don't think that's all of it, but some of it. Actually, that's a good question. Is the other stuff right next to it? No. How much is that? This is 
No, that's just like a tiny amount. Okay, so we're gonna keep that and we're gonna keep looking for the, oh, this is what I could do though. I can use these Photoshop features I never use like, um, uh, sorry, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to think. I know it's terrible when I think. No, no, it's not gonna be this either, is it? No. Isn't this fun watching me look for these layers? At this point, I probably could have just painted it. There we go. And now that I've committed to it. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn on this one. I'm going to make it additive. So that when I go here and put this underneath it, you'll see both of them. And then I'll merge them. And now I'm stuck doing them all. All right, and now I guys gotta quickly flip through. I think that's most of them, but I think there's another one. I told you there's more. So I was ideally this would have all been handled on my importer, but my importer did not do what I asked it to do. So, all right. So now I'm going to put this back to add, so I can add to both of them because now I've got both of them in the frame. I think there's more, but I'm gonna stop because I'm getting bored of doing this. So I'm gonna just take this. This will give me a head start from having to manually do it all. Put it here. I'm gonna go back. We're gonna make a, I'll make a selection set in a minute. This way I don't have to dig through here anymore. But now I've gotta turn this off and turn everything else on. Okay. Now, oh, that's a tiny amount. Good job, Lee. All right, you see this, this is, this is all my own fault. So what I'm going to do is just see if I can, see how I'm just kind of making those kind of blue green more so than they were anyways. I'm losing a little bit of uh, subsurface perhaps on some of those, which I could probably retain if I wanted to just by, yeah, okay. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna undo that so I can put it on a different layer. And then this layer go back and grab that again uh, this layer will be in a hard light it's like a bad photo seeing yourself in a hard light I'll just move in closer so you can see so see that kind of stomps some of the shading and uh, subsurface scattering going on there but if I go to hard light see it's retaining a lot of it there you go uh, and that lets me keep that that blue green color in there but of course now i really should find those other ones oh it's gonna annoy me sorry everyone you get to watch me dig through some more layers because i actually think that works better than i thought it was gonna work it's not gonna dig through the layers uh uh complain complain how would i start at the bottom said the vicar to the actress all right uh, nope not that not that that looking for these ones that are hard to see because I'm like, it's gonna be one of these ones that's mostly a little black thumbnail. Like that is one of them. This one, I bet, I bet they're gonna be next to each other. No, why could they just not be next to each other? Why would they logically need to group? That would just be too easy for me, wouldn't it? All right, so we got one more anyways. I got this one, which is that piece. So we'll move it up. Let's try this one. Nope. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there are many, many ways that writing is superior to visual art. That's actually, you know, what's interesting. I always, I talk to people about this sometimes is that, uh, I mean, I really enjoy writing as well. Um, I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, I'm good. I'm just saying I enjoy it. Uh, uh and interesting thing though is, um, writing it. If, if you work, if, if you're like a freelance artist or illustrator and you work with people who are not used to working with visual artists at all, and they're describing the thing that they want you to do, and this sometimes happens with writers, they just, you know, visuals are not good at communicating like, um, you have to pick like, like two or three things and that's it. That's all you get. 
and it's like describing an emotion it can't be a like well you know this character is coming over the hill and the sunlight's happening and we can see the whole city in the background and then they're holding a sword and next to them is three friends and they're each holding a symbolic important element like though people will describe it that way and that is not how visuals work that is not how illustration or uh that's not how images work with narrative it's it's got to work on a more fundamental layer than that and if it is that specific you get to pick like a couple of things and that's it because otherwise it's a mess and people it doesn't it just bounces off people you've got to have a hierarchy of these things and uh that's very different than you know uh many other art forms and sometimes uh but I, it's it's basically consistent like if i work with somebody who's never worked with visual artists it's almost always they have this really overly detailed description of every possible thing you could try and put into a single image and there are you know you could probably count on, the, on your hand the number of images that work with that sort of complexity <laughs> yeah, there. and it's not just a measure of the artist it's uh it's a lot of things but uh anyways that's that's definitely something i've noticed over the years all right look at we're, we're honing in on most of these This is why it pays to be organized. Organized. Which I'm clearly not at this state. Well, to be fair to myself, this is the first time I've used Unreal's rendering engine for this sort of work. And I didn't realize uh, this is how it was gonna come out. Uh, so I could probably, there are probably better settings I could have used. That would get me a little closer to what I want. But we're most of the way there. Yes, that's exactly right, Jeremy. <laughs> it's actually great information to have all of that stuff. Like, you just you just can't. Uh, it just you it's you can't put it all directly in an over literal way into the image and expect it to work. I'll say it that way. That's the way. It's probably a good way to say it. But of course, having a great backstory it's fantastic all right um, so I finally I finally did it everyone I'm so proud of myself I think I got most of them that most of them and you know the ones I don't have are providing a little nice color contrast so I'm not worried about it. so you don't want it to be monochrome anyways that's what I'll tell myself I'm just erasing a little bit of it because I don't want it to be too glowing. And then I'll just get like a really opaque little brush and just go in and brush some of those on so that it feels a little more um, uh, organic, a little less like I did a color overlay. Not saying I did a color overlay, but clearly. Gotta make sure this brush is big enough. This is a fiddly weird little brush that's hard to get a sense of sometimes but I love it I love to brush I use this brush all the time it's actually the brush that I sign my name in too digitally it's the only brush I will sign my name in digitally it's not really true I mean I do use this primarily but it's not the only one I'll <laughs> agree to sign my name as if it's some sort of sacred act And these are uh, fine details, so they're not coming through so well. So I'm going to go back down here. I'm just going to paint some of these branches in a little bit better. I'm not sure how much we're really going to see these anyways, but you see it's a little too fine for the renderer to do properly, even though it's very easy to paint them at that res or that thickness. Stuff like that. CG stuff. <laughs> I like the Choose Your Adventure story you guys are writing here. Edward Packard would be proud. 
think Edward Packard died not too long ago as well. I think I remember reading that. Maybe it was maybe it was a different one of the. Oh, it was certainly one of the illustrators who illustrated a couple of the Choose Your Own Adventure books from the '80s that um, died recently. That's what I'm remembering. As in maybe a month or two ago, a couple months ago, something like that. So I'm just adding a little more, since I'm in here, fiddling around, just adding a little more uh, barky, barking like texture. All right, cool. All right, well, that was a lot of work for that, but you know, I think overall I like that better than the, just adding a little bit of color around, a little bit of saturation color around this to stand out a little bit more. Versus a dedicated art program. You mean like, um like Clip Studio or something along those lines? Or are you thinking of anyone in particular, I should ask? I've used most all of them. Uh, all the advantages. But I want to make sure that's what you're asking. I'm not sure if that's what you mean or you mean something else. Oh, like Art Rage. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's on some level it's just a tool, so whatever works for you. It's fine. Um, my feeling, I mean, I've used Photoshop a long time and Photoshop is far from perfect for, for a digital art program, you know, um, far from perfect. Um, but it, you know, it's a big program and it's still got a lot of great stuff in it. Um, Clip Studio, I do like as well. And I've used a bit. Uh, I bought it years ago and uh, it's brush engine is definitely superior to Photoshop's, I would say by far by far, uh, and at least as it relates to things like ink. Um, the, I, I'm, the mixer brush works pretty well for me in Photoshop, um, and I haven't really spent much time uh, exploring the equivalent of that in something like Clip Studio, but uh, Photoshop um, is uh, got a couple of fatal flaws with ink, and I'll, I'll demonstrate to you here really easily. So. Um, this is a Photoshop hard round brush that uh, fades when uh, on pen pressure. Look at that tip. This is a, this is a famous thing in Photoshop. So what this should be imitating is like a comic book feathering out there to a point. It's actually not possible to do in Photoshop very well. It's very difficult to get that stroke. And now Photoshop has since added a smoothing thing uh, sometime that can help. But see, it still kind of is, smoothing mainly is smoothing your lines, like sampling your thing, but it still doesn't work great for that. Now, there is a solution to this if you if you do want to use Photoshop. There's this amazing plugin I highly recommend that's not just for Photoshop, it's for any input in Windows, but it works really well with Photoshop and it's called Lazy Mizumi Pro and I think it's around 15 bucks. It does a lot of amazing things, including smoothing pressure gain. So now watch. Now I have a perfect, look at the tip of that. I'll just take a slower one so you can see it better. Well, I usually do. It's still tapering a bit there, which is not, I must have something a little off here because uh, there you go. Lazy Mizumi is great. So it's it's still, um, you know, so you can now get more comic style hash lines. It's still not, and it's not Lazy Mizumi's fault and you can increase it a bit. It's still a little, um, there you go. So now see I'm, getting a little bit better. It's still Photoshop's fault. <laughs> uh, and I know this because if you use Clip Studio, you will never run into this. Their brushes uh, deal with that perfectly. Uh, so um, that's one thing I'd say. If you're gonna ink and you don't really care about being in Photoshop, then don't use it. Um, Clip Studio I like. I actually find the interface overall a bit noisy and frustrating. That may be because I'm used to Photoshop. Um, I really like the iPad and I really love Procreate and the brush engine is really good there as well. Um, uh, but it's on the iPad and if I could, if I had a setup that let me stream some stuff on the iPad, I'd probably be using that for more things. Um, but I recommend that one as well. Uh, I'm not a big fan of tools like ArtRage, not because I think there's anything wrong with them, but for me, if a tool starts to try and spend too much of its effort imitating natural media, um, like, you know, including like shading of brush strokes, then I'm not, that's just not the tool for me. That's just not what I'm interested in. Um, which isn't to say there's anything wrong with it if that's what you want to do. Um, but that's not what I want to do. Uh, so yeah, 
I don't I don't tend to use those sort of tools. Um, if that makes sense, yeah. Oh, I guess I could try that, uh, Jeremy. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. But Proc Procreate is great and super cheap. Um, I mean, Photoshop is still a very solid program and it has a lot of stuff it can do with layers and color adjustments and stuff like that. Most of the things that have been added, um, most of the things that have been added uh, to Photoshop over the years are not really for digital painters. Um, and so I think there's been a lot of frustration in the community for that. Um, that being said, the on the iPad anyways, the um, their app, um, Fresco has gotten pretty pretty great. It's I still prefer um, I think I still prefer Procreate uh, for a variety of reasons, but it's pretty good. So um, uh, there's that one if you are interested in using something more Adobe like. Um, yeah. Uh, what else have I used that I like? Um, well, sometimes I use them for specific things. Like I, I do use Clip Studio for inking. So like if I specifically want to use ink, but I don't like, I'm just not as familiar with Clip Studio. So when it's like, you know, jumping around and using blend modes and things like that, I'm just not as familiar with it. And that's on me. So it's not as useful for me. Um, but I think it's from what I've seen. It seems just as capable. Um, if you want a, a low cost or free option, uh, I think it's um, Credit Studio. Um, is something that is you know I, I think it doesn't have all the features of these other programs but it's kind of open source and it's been getting better and better from what i understand i've been seeing some people really into it so that might be worth looking at if you're not already committed to a certain app um, i try and stay flexible to some extent you know but the, but I, th I feel like my bandwidth to learn new stuff is limited right like so i mean just in, at any given time so i usually am learning new programs and for me, so for the most part, it's been more on the uh, the uh, 3D side has been where I've been more of the newer programs I've used. So like um, uh, I've been using a lot over the last couple of years, been using Blender, but previous to that, I didn't use it at all. Um, I use ZBrush quite a bit, which I've used for a long time, but not that frequently. So I've been using it more. Um, I really like the VR apps uh, like, uh, like Adobe Medium, Gravity Sketch, things like that, uh, and I've been using those quite a bit, but that's been more of where I've kind of grown in terms of new tools versus, you know, finding a Photoshop alternative or, or experimenting with some of the other ones that are out there. Um, there are a handful of things that would make Photoshop much more interesting to me that I think are, I think are relatively modest investments that, that uh, have not come along, <laughs> so. I mean, it did take 25 years to get a symmetry tool for drawing, which is insane. I'm glad to see that it looks like they're stopping trying to jam shitty 3D into Photoshop uh, now that they have better dedicated 3D apps out there, uh, which should be nice. So maybe that'll de bloat it a little bit. You know, I mean, once, once you have so many features in an app, it becomes so, or any sort of code base, it becomes hard to add new stuff. It just takes longer. So it, um, and then you got to test everything and it just, it, you know, it's just bigger, more complex program. So uh, since my needs, I'm not really interested in, you know, using free stock to make crappy marketing mockups, then I don't really care about like all those features, but maybe a lot of people use Photoshop do. I just don't, which is fine. You know, they, they have a giant user base. Yeah, I know, uh, it's, it's crazy. But then there's other things in Photoshop where you're like, okay, Illustrator, who I think still has like the worst UX of any Adobe program. I, I, and I understand that like people have used Illustrator for a long time, disagree, and that's totally fine. Totally fine, you guys can have it. Um, but but because, of the, because they have Illustrator, the vector tools in Photoshop are bad. <laughs> Because their answer is like, well, I'll just go to Illustrator and do it there. I'm like, yeah, but every time I open Illustrator, it's like pulling a molar. I don't want to use Illustrator. I don't like anything about using Illustrator. Yes, it has great 
vector tools. But other than that, I'd rather just never look it in the face. Never make eye contact with Illustrator if I could spend my whole life. I'd be happy. I'm exaggerating, but. Whereas even on their tools like Fresco, you know, the vector layers are pretty much just another layer type and you can draw in real time with vectors without using, you know, like impossible to select Bezier handles uh, with weird ass direct indirect selection tools, which is the Illustrator UX, because uh, it's been around forever. Uh, you know, same with, same with Clip Studio has great vector stuff too, as does Fresco. Uh, they're terrible in Photoshop. Yeah, I mean, and that's fair, right? Like, the, it's called Photoshop for a reason. Uh, it, it's, it has a lot of great stuff in it, for sure. So it's, it's easy to critique, for sure, but it has a lot of great things in it. So I have noticed I have a lot of these little uh, boogers around here. See all those little boogers? And what those boogers are from is from my color correction layer here, I think. No? I thought it was. What are those boogers from? Something I did. Let's see if I can figure out what created I mean, I, I don't actually dislike them. I, they add a little interesting noise, but I don't think it was intentional. So I'm trying to figure out where they came from. Did it come from the way I masked the sky? Is that maybe it? I don't know where those came from. Are they in the original? Okay, well, they're in the render. Hmm. I don't actually know what those are. I actually kind of like them, but I just don't know what they even are. It looks like errors in the render. Easy to fix if I want to fix them. I can literally just smudge or, or paint those out. But given that I'm going to have some uh, noise on top of it, uh, if I turn on my noise here, it'll probably just make it gel a little bit. It's a little too much noise at the moment. Let's lower this opacity. Yeah, somewhere like that. Yeah, I'll figure it out. Boogers, yeah. Uh, I usually call those, um, uh, what do you call those? Nards, dangling nards, loose nards, free wandering nards. There are a lot of names for them in the illustration industry. <laughs> you see, they can just blip them out if I want to get rid of them. Sometimes having things that up close look weird actually look good in the final illustration to have like sometimes like a really hard edge on objects looks really bad up close, uh, but sometimes you know, to contrast some of the looser stuff, uh, it can actually be really nice. I'm actually gonna go back to a more standard brush for these instead of a mixer brush, cause I'm trying to paint this out. How about mask main tree from noise to make it pop? Uh, that's not really how I use noise. It's not a bad idea, but that's not how I'd use noise. I don't, no, noise doesn't have like a narrative content to me. So like, I think it is more, it'd be more like if I was painting on canvas, trying to like gesso the area of where the canvas or the tree is extra smooth, which is not something I would do. But um, uh, if I didn't like the way it looked, I could do that. But I, I kind of, I think one of the things, the way that noise works for me, the way I like to use it is it's a unifier. It's kind of like doing, um, not a scumble, but maybe more like a glaze on top a little bit, even though it's not a glaze at all, but it kind of functions the same sort of way where it kind of puts everything, it kind of helps everything gel. And so excluding things from it. That being said, I do have fades on it already, um, which is like, I think I went over this earlier, maybe you weren't here, like the, um, like like this if this noise here has a, um, is being faded over this value range and it's not in the brightest areas as well. So, you know. Kind of does kind of does that a little bit but not specifically based on like the tree versus the background more based on the value range you're addicted to landscapes <laughs> calgon wow i think that that ages you uh trail boots <laughs> i know what it is but it definitely ages me <laughs> i don't know that's probably not that's probably not was that even a that's probably is that a uniquely american thing too Calgon, take me away, Calgon. Is it, does any, do any of my UK friends, if you're here, do you know what that means? Is that a reference you understand? <laughs> Not a UK one. Uh, Calpol, yeah, I, so Calgon, 
Yeah, I, I, from what I remember, um, uh, yeah. So it's it's a it's a cleaning thing, and there's it's one of these. Uh, I want to say maybe 1960s or 70s in origin, like the logo, the phrase rather, the motto. Even though the, these ads have been run up easily through the 80s, which is probably where I'm remembering them from. But it's a uh, it's like a housewife, you know, who's of course they're the one doing all the cleaning because men are at work doing manly things, that sort of bullshit. But uh, I think she's fantasizing about not having to work so hard to scrub things. And she's like, take me away, Calgon. Like, transplant me from this life of prosaic cleaning to the land of magical sparkly bits where everything is effortlessly cleaned. <laughs> that, that's a, yeah, that sort of thing. I think that's, that's what I remember anyways. I haven't seen that ad in a long time. Something to do with cleaning and social roles. <laughs> In fantasy, I don't know. Oh, yeah! Don't don't drink don't drink Calgon. Calgon is not a, a drinkable thing. This is a good point. See, I don't even know what cowpole is. Am I saying it right? Cowpole. I'm reducing some of these rock sizes, by the way. They're just a little too big. So I'm just doing some painting and some quick clone stamping to take some of them out of the frame. So they are a bit too much, too big. It's just because the camera is low. I don't think they're out of scale on the thing. I just don't want them. I just don't want that much of it here. Ancient Chinese secret. Yeah, there's yeah. The ancient Chinese secret one is another weird racist ad. <laughs> That's right. Probably I don't want to be dating back to like the Chinese launderer. I don't know. I don't even know. Like I I that stuff was around. The, those sort of ads were around when I was a kid, but. I never understood the context. It wasn't in my everyday life in any meaningful way, so I had no idea what that was, all that stuff was directly referring to. Terrible. Some of this color in there, there we go. Happy little rocks. Don't want these value contrast down here. I'm gonna paint some of this out. Is inadvertent diversity. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure ancient Chinese secret was not diversity in any meaningful way other than just being racist. I had, I had enough diversity in my life, even at that point to understand that. <laughs> but yeah, uh, at that point in my life, I probably would have been in a, a fairly white area in uh, suburbia. It's not where I grew up, though. That was more high school era. Elementary school was a very, very different experience for me. You've been studying the layouts and composition of landscapes. Is there is a uh, trail boots any any artists sticking with you that you really love, or any sort of types of compositions that work best for you or you find compelling? Go back to my mixer brush. You can see I'm kind of just jumping all over the place. At this stage, I'm just, I just move all over the place. I'm kind of avoiding the hard work of working on the tree and the priest, <laughs> to be honest with you today. I'm kind of just skipping around a bit. Just trying to make, uh, I mean, I actually do anyways. I try to make the overall composition work before I focus in on details most of the time, but.
Uh, no, uh, Mr. Uh, I mean, yeah, what, what is that? Calgon, Calgon, yeah. Calcium buildup, maybe? That's, is that, that's my best guess. Or maybe it's a desire of conservative middle America to get rid of Californians, and they're like, if only those Californians would be gone. And then the dumb bastard realized that would lose most of America's uh, gross national product. And they're like, oh, wait a minute. We have to tolerate you dirty hippies. <laughs> Wikipedia would agree that uh, there's a lot of California hate coming from the middle of this country. That's only because it's been written by coastal elites, clearly. Sorry, I'm just teasing everyone. Don't take me too seriously. Uh, well, I'm glad my, uh, my intuition about calcium buildup is there. Why is my brush doing things I don't want to? There's something weird going on. I'm getting a weird texture that I wasn't earlier in a different blending mode. I don't think it's my brush. It seems so normal brushes are fun. There's something weird going on with the mixing brush and I don't understand what it is. Oh, I know what it is. All right, so here's a little, here's a, uh, Remember how I was saying earlier, I really wish that the mixing brush had the same options as a normal sampler. Here's why. All right, so I was using the mixing brush, <clears throat> the mixer brush as it, rather, and I was sampling these things. I noticed it up here and I was like, oh, it's got a little extra tooth and maybe I'm on the wrong brush. And then I was like, okay, so I had my sample all layers in and I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I wanna smooth this out. And I was like, wait, that's, why does it look like, wait, I didn't sample any black, that's the opposite. Well, what is happening is I have my noise layers on. And even though the noise layers aren't super visible because they're in overlay mode and whatnot, they are there. So if I turn them off and you see now I use the exact same brush to be on this layer and paint, it's fine. And that is, um, that is because the mixer brush does not have the ability to ignore layers above it or any later categories, excuse me, later categories when sampling. Whereas with your eyedropper tool, what you would do is you would just set it to like, um, do, 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 where is it at? You would set the eyedropper tool to be, you know, current and below, or so, for example. But the mixer brush doesn't have the option. So what I was doing was sampling some of the noisy pixels from basically a layer that is optically invisible, because it's just sort of my post-process there to add that noise, and it was fucking up all my brush strokes. So that is exactly why, uh, that is exactly why I want that feature. So there's a, there's a quick example. The other feature I want is so in a normal Photoshop brush, I'll show you this too. And this would be another simple one. I don't know why it doesn't happen. So in a normal Photoshop brush, and this is just a simple hard dark brush, and you actually get this. So if you paint and then you hold down tilde key, it erases with that same brush and you can let it go and paint and so on and so forth. And that's nice. So if you're using like a textured brush, rather than having to make an eraser brush that matches it. So if I'm using this texture brush, I can just hold down tilde whenever I want to cut back into it. I'm like, oh, and I'm painting. So I don't have to switch tools and it uses the exact same settings and textures my brush. Well, that doesn't work for the mixer brush. Mixer brush doesn't have that. It should. There's another thing it should have. All right. There you go. There's, there's some unsolicited features I want from the mixer brush. So there you go, everyone. Just in case you're at home writing some code for Adobe, now you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely, you know. That's that's the the more complex tools get, the more this sort of stuff happens. For sure. Yeah. Uh, well, you know what? Tilda Swinton could hold me down. That's all right. Sorry, that's TMI. I'm just joking. It's fine. All right. So I'm gonna go here and. That would be good though if they called the brush Tilda Swinton. <laughs> She's awesome. I really like her work. 
the one that I'm missing here is softening some of these little high frequency detail that would never be painted in this way. It's just an artifact of using some CG as part of this process. So I'm just going in. Yes, she probably would. Why not? She's into it. She'd kick my ass. I should write her, Dear Tilda. Although my safe word is Swinton, so if you hear that. <laughs> Are you, uh, Mooster, is that a reference to Only Lovers Left Alive? I love that movie. And that movie has such a great soundtrack too. And I didn't realize at the time when I first heard the soundtrack that that um, that a lot of that sort of electronic noise stuff is um, is the director's band. Jim Jarmusch has a band, and that's some of their work. <laughs> what we do in shadows also great for totally different reasons. <laughs> I am, um, my daughter jokingly calls me Laszlo. Anytime he's being completely inappropriate, she's like, oh, it's you, dad. Thanks, honey. All right, just roughing up. I'm zoomed way too far in, but some every once in a while I have to do that. I have to get there and let myself zoom way in. I see these. Things over here, it's helpful to zoom out because these are way too uh, sharp. So I'm just going to soften them in a more painterly way than say depth of field, which I'm not a big fan of using depth of field in images. Not camera depth of field. I mean, if I'm taking photos. Or if I was trying to be photorealistic, it'd be appropriate, but. <laughs> I think many of us have had that supervisor trail boots. <laughs> Colin energy vampire sort of supervisors. mainly just pushed around small things today but I think it's still getting better I think I still improved the image from the start all right I got a little bit of time left and oh I did want to do let's see a couple things so one thing I was going to show just because it might be interesting is uh, how to relight an image uh, relight uh, elements of an image like so if I wanted let's say on this tree I wanted a little bit more of a bounce or rim light on this uh, this lower side down in here uh, and uh, of course you could you could just paint it but i didn't uh you know it can take work to do that without um destroying the form where we've got like undulations and detail like that so certainly uh one thing that you could do is uh, one way to do it other than just manually painting it is to use a normal map so i'm going to just uh, copy it out of here just to show you this real quick in case you're interested so i'm going to grab this uh, this is a world, uh, the normal if I rendered out of the original render, so it looks kind of like this. Um, and uh, so, you know, of course, it's a normal map, right? So each each color represents a, a vector, a direction. And if I wanted, say, some rim light coming in here off this, this bottom direction, what you could do is you could just go in here and just do a color. So let's select by color range would be one way to do it, uh, which has this ridiculously tiny preview window because it be still never increases the size of the preview windows for whatever reason. Can't imagine this would tax a modern computer, but here we are. 
anyways, so you could do that and uh, I just might maybe select a little bit more. Okay, hit okay. And now what I'll do is I'll hide this. I'm just gonna create a new layer, I'll show you this. And so now when I paint, um, I know, let's say I want to do this kind of teal color here. So you can see what happens. I'm just quickly painting here, right? It is, it's not the right value right now necessarily, but it's constrained it to that direction for me automatically. Now, if I set this to something like overlay or soft light or something like that, or screen, maybe screen would be the best and use screen, um, you'll get an additive process or somewhat of an additive process like light is. Uh, screen's kind of a, like a little more toned back. So you can quickly kind of go in here and um, you know, now I've introduced a light coming from that direction that's just hitting this tree uh, without having to relight it. So I'm going to just do it really big and gross here for a second just to not spend any subtlety on it at the moment. <clears throat> right? And then you can, now I've got rid of that selection, I can go back in and just, you know, just go back and erase it or tone it down. You could even, of course, paint different color in here, put it only where you want it. It doesn't understand, of course, shadow direction or any shadowing or occlusion. It's just a, a direction. So you have to, you know, something's going to be occluded. Uh, could break the illusion depending on what you're doing. But anyways, I, I don't use it a ton, but I use it enough to make it worthwhile when I'm in there to at least save out a normal map, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's just, if you if you have a 3D scene anyways, it makes sense to render it out, because it takes very little effort. And now you've got that as an option if you want to use them. And you can still paint on top of it, but it's just sort of saved me a bit of time. Plus, it's as quick to experiment with, right? So if I'm like, you know, if I wanted a little more happening in that lower corner, similarly, I can just go in here and just do another color range selection. It's like this area. Let's maybe add a little bit more than that. I get the fuzziness to get more of this. Get a little bounce light coming up off here. I mean, it's a pretty diffuse surface, so it doesn't need to be a ton of bounce light, but it's not about reality. It's about drama or interest or whatever else you're exploring. So you see how like that's really quick to do, right? I mean, I could really crank it up and go for the overuse of rim light that most people do, but um, <laughs> in my opinion, <laughs> but uh, you know, either way, you can still get a little bit in here. And it can help readability and all sorts of things. And it doesn't take much. It's on a layer, so you can always erase it if you don't like it. See, so, but like down here, getting a little bit more down here is nice. <clears throat> I might reduce the saturation a bit on this. And maybe the value's a little too strong, but that's all right. So it draws, draws you in a little bit more anyways. And I could have spent this time in, um, of course you could spend this time in the 3D side doing some of this, but <clears throat> this is, I, I still try to get the lighting on the like the overall 3d side good but um this this is just another tool you can use once you're sort of in painting and because you might have changed the colors of the lighting or emphasized it differently so this just gives you another way to do it when you're not in 3d and it's very fast i'm just sort of quickly experimenting yes yes you are correct i wonder nowadays even how many people who um paint traditionally still use digitals for their comps or to kind of work up some of the some of that stuff um, just you know just because it's like you said it's so convenient Anyway, so that's one tool you can certainly use for that sort of stuff. I, I can usually turn it on and off. It's just added a little bit more depth and roundness to this. It's probably a little much in parts. That's all right. You can, you know, even like if I was like, oh, okay, well, this looks okay up here, but it should be a little bit brighter. Then I could go up and make it a little brighter. But in my case, I'm actually going to get rid of it because up here, I'm going to get rid of it because I actually want the darker value against that sky there. And uh, it's a little strong for a bounce light coming all the way up there. So I'm just going to tone that down a little bit. But you know, it's whatever choices you want to make. Sound like I was totally a Bob Ross thing to say. Hey, Booster. Thank you for stopping by. Yeah, I gotta take off in a few minutes as well. 
because I have to go make dinner. My mom's coming over. I gotta make her some dinner. All right. I'm gonna make another layer. I wanna do, I wanna see if I could find, I'm just gonna do a quick experiment. Now I have these foliage brushes that I did not make. I bought these foliage brushes and they're mostly not useful to me. Uh, <laughs> but there was one weird little tree shape and I have no idea which one it was that I did use. I think I used it as part of the basis of that, um, the leaves on our original sketch. Uh, and I was like, I wonder if I could find it again to use for this tree. Thanks for coming by, Deidre. I appreciate it. It's nice to talk with you. I'm looking forward to seeing the cosplay plus the Elvira. Um, what am I making for dinner? Um, I am making, I can't remember. I mean, I know I'm making pork chops with other stuff, but I don't remember. Um, I don't remember all the details of my recipe at the moment. And then there's carrots too. How about that? I'm trying to find, I have this blue beef dinner. Oh my, you're bringing back all the 80s ads today. <laughs> all right, that's right. That was like the sound, if I remember right, wasn't that? That was the one like the old cowboy sound. Beef, it's what's for dinner. That guy. It's like, who wants to fill their colon with 10 pounds of undigested meat? You do. Eat beef. I don't remember what, I don't remember which one these, one of these things had this kind of weird little quality to it, is leaves that I was using. I don't remember which one it was. As I said, most of the time I'm just using my own foliage brushes, but I use a different one for this and I liked it, but I can't remember which one it was. I'm gonna have to go through all these. So there's another Photoshop short key, if I remember right, is if you use greater than or less than keys, is that right? Yeah, you can quickly go through the different brushes. Like, and then since I have the edge highlighted, I might be able to figure out from the edge which one it is. <laughs> Unless it's huge like that. The other white meat. <laughs> Just funny because pork is not really white meat. These are some more of my brushes. Someday, I'll keep track of this better. Now it looks like the last, this is gonna be like the thumbnail on my thing I'm posting is this really terrible. <laughs> All right. That's true. Drown, drowning things in bechamel sauce. I mean, there's probably a good lasagna in there, but it's not generally how I cook. Mm. You know, see, the, the thing I'm trying to find is this weird quality that's in there, and I can't quite find it. That's all right. Uh, I don't need to find it right now. I just was hoping to maybe have it. I can manually paint it. Yeah, I want to add, um, I think what I want to do eventually is add a little more of this um, sort of blue-green foliage just around. I might, I might extend these things a little bit and add a little bit more around the top. I don't know, I don't know, maybe, just a little bit. I also just might put more uh, blowing uh, stuff in the wind coming off the tree up there instead of leafing it out, which might be a little bit more appropriate for the image. Leafing it out. Uh, yeah. Oh, you know, another thing, and this is the thing that everyone has to do, is of course we have to add our some more glowy ball stuff. So let's do some glow balls. Uh, we're just gonna go in here and do some glow balls. And I think I was gonna push the orange on this because we did that experiment earlier a little bit and I was like, I could just paint that part in. Uh, I'll probably, yeah, something. I might get it a little redder than that. This, this might be another good opportunity to, um, for me to use some more of that normal matte masking because I want to kick off um, some light coming up from this ball up on the lower part of the face, for example. I could go in here 
and just sort of select that area on the face. So let's get that yellow, kind of putrid yellow. Right here. Let's add, a, let's add, a, let's add, a, add a little bit more of it. Okay. Let's go in here and add a little bit of. Shouldn't this be in screen? It should be in screen mode. I thought it was in screen mode. It is not. It's not perfect. I'm going to erase some of this. I'm just trying to get the value where I want it before I. I didn't get the vector exactly right on that angle there that I wanted, but um, it's all right. Because there'd be some occlusion stopping some of this from kicking up. That's all right though. Didn't get enough of it. Still saved me some time. I like it on the eyebrows up there. It's pretty good there. Just need a little more contrast with that right there. Something like that. Sunsets are red and mornings are cooler. Um, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes. I think that's generally a, um, you know, because the, the day's been heated up the whole day, right? So. All right. All right. Yeah, I have some, um, in terms of adding a little small things into the atmosphere, I do want to add some. I actually have a little dust collection here that I haven't used yet that are probably just masks like these little guys. Uh, these are a little bit big. These are ones I've rendered out from a variety of programs and they're good for um, you know scattering little things like that. So you mentioned fireflies, that's why I thought of this. So like if I grabbed this little sucker, I mean just drop it into the alpha channel and make it a little easier to select right now. So if I grab this and go back yaw and let's put another screen layer on go and add it's probably it's really hard to see so I'm just gonna double the strength so I can make it more visible okay so now I've got all these Let's see is that one too what's this layer yeah not quite there yet so I just make it a little bit stronger and then um, yeah, so now I've got all this noise, if you will, around the area, and I can, um, can kind of move it where I want it, and then uh, localize it, make it brighter, less bright, etc. Make it smaller, bigger, just kind of mask it in and out as needed. So if I wanted to give like a little bit more sense of light, well, hopefully it's not going to be that. Uh, what I'm going to do is give it a little bit, actually, instead of brightening it, what I'll do is I'll give it a, maybe a subtle amount of outer glow. Let's see what that looks like. So it reads as, I mean, I don't want to get too, um, friendship is magic with it, but, uh, a little more sparkly, maybe. Let's see here. Get rid of the noise. The size is way too big. Okay. A little bit of softness and I'm gonna take down the opacity a little bit. Go a little bit. Something like that. And then what I'll do is I can then just put like a, a layer mask. So what I'll do is what I like to do is layer mask everything. So just do a hide all and then reveal it as I need it as opposed to the other way. So it's just a little more intentional for me. So now I can kind of like paint into my layer mask around the areas where I want some of this to come out. And I could, you know, a lot of times people will motion blur it and other things like that. Uh, if you want to like a, a big, bigger sense of movement, but I think right now it has just enough blur in it that'll be okay. And if I wanted to colorize it or paint in it directly, I could do that. I might add more later, but we'll just keep it right around there for now. Just like that. Just like that. Yeah. I have many different types of uh, layers of the stuff that I might use. So I'm going to have to stop for the day because I got to go cook. But just to sort of show you, that's kind of about where we're at right now. Um, 
still is a lot that could be done with it. I need to, uh, of course, the tree and the, um, I think overall the composition's fine. Uh, I, I really want to focus on the tree and uh, those priests next. I think of the areas that need it most and then kind of reevaluate what else I need to do. Um, so a little more color in some of the faces of the tree, some of the better integration of the foliage here and there and the grasses around the base. And then um, and then the priests need some, some love too. Uh, and then I'll go from there and see where it winds up. But yeah. Baroque painting mouthfill from the lowered horizon eye in the way the clouds. I don't, is, is a lower horizon a Baroque thing? I'm not sure it is, but yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, it definitely has some of the contrast you might get in a Baroque landscape. Uh, thank you everyone for coming by and witnessing this. Dun, dun, dun. Wait, I gotta click on, oh, jump up to you and your Baroque. I'm gonna look at this. Yeah. Also, that's American. That can't be a broke. America didn't exist when the broke period was really around. All right, folks. Thank you for coming by. I appreciate it. And thanks for the encouragement and feedback and conversation. Uh, have a good uh, rest of your Sunday. And I will see you next week. Where we'll either be working on this and finishing it up or I'll finish it during the week and kind of walk you through what I did and starting something new. Bye, everybody. Peaches are good with pork. You are correct. That's the last thing I'll say. <laughs>